Hi again, everyone. In this lecture, we'll talk about our understanding of the solar system as a whole. As opposed to the previous few lectures, where we've been focusing on the universe as perceived from Earth, we'll be talking about the universe as it truly is, as it would look if you were on an alien spaceship looking down on our solar system from above. So let me start with a question. What do you picture when you hear the phrase Earth or planet Earth? Most people alive today picture something like this. A brilliant blue globe with land masses interspersed. We take this global view for granted and forget that pictured like, pictures like this are artifacts of relatively recent history and that as recently as our parents' or grandparents' generations, this view didn't exist. Images like this weren't possible until Earth orbit was achieved in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. This image, taken by a US-launched V2 rocket in 1946, was the first image of the Earth taken from space. It's a far cry from this one, the famous blue marble photo taken by the crew aboard the Apollo 17 spacecraft on their way to the moon almost three decades later in 1972. This image, one of the most widely distributed images ever taken, was the first time that we saw the entire Earth from above, as an outsider would. Here is another famous image, this one taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft in 1990. Although it does not look as spectacular as the last, it's much more profound. This is an image of Earth as viewed from the outer edge of the solar system, 6 billion kilometers or 3.7 billion miles from Earth. That's right, Earth is this tiny blue-white speck here, which is what led this image to be dubbed the pale blue dot. Here's the same image, and a similar one taken of Venus, with a larger field of view, bringing the sun into the frame. This shows that the brown lines running across the image are streaks of sunlight reflecting off the spacecraft. It puts our planet in context as a tiny speck orbiting the mighty sun. It fits in with our modern conception of the solar system as something like this. A set of eight, or nine, depending on who you ask, planets orbiting the sun. In the past four lectures, we've taken this bird's eye view of the solar system for granted in explaining how objects move in the night sky. But how did we arrive at this picture in the first place? It wasn't trivial. It took hundreds of years to arrive at a satisfying model of the solar system one that could explain all of the apparent motions that you've been learning about over the course of the past several lectures, plus a few more that I'll talk about today. People were persecuted, even executed, for suggesting this view, which removes the Earth from the center of the universe. To begin, let me introduce three terms that we'll need to use to explain models of the solar system. The first word is cosmology which broadly speaking means model of the universe. Although the word cosmology has a slightly different meaning in modern astronomy, which we'll discuss later in this course, in a historical sense, cosmologies are models of the universe, and in particular the solar system. They describe where the Earth, Sun, Moon, planets, and stars lie and how they move relative to one another. Historically, cosmologies fall into two categories. Heliocentric cosmologies are those in which the sun is the center of the solar system. The word heliocentric comes from helio, meaning sun, and centric, meaning centered. So these are sun-centered models. Heliocentric models are on record as early as the 3rd century BC when the ancient Greek scholar Aristarchus of Samos proposed an early heliocentric model commemorated in this Greek postage stamp. But these models didn't reach the level of mathematical sophistication needed to explain motions in the night sky until the late 1600s, 
and were debated throughout the 16th and 17th century before becoming widely accepted. For more than 1,000 years prior to the late 1600s, so-called geocentric cosmologies were in vogue. Here, geo means earth, so these are earth-centered models. These models place the earth at the center of the solar system. As we begin to describe these early models, take a step back and think about what it means to distinguish between geo and heliocentric cosmologies. If you were stuck here on Earth, before air travel, before satellite imagery, before the printing press, how would you know that the Earth revolved around the Sun and not the other way around? If you didn't have the global view of the Earth and the solar system that we take for granted today, how would you distinguish between geo and heliocentric cosmologies? It certainly appears from our perspective that the Sun is a tiny disk orbiting the Earth, not a nuclear fusion-fueled ball of plasma 330,000 times more massive than the Earth and 93 million miles away. The rotation of Earth around its axis means that we're spinning around in our orbit about 1,000 miles per hour. Our revolution around the sun moves us 18 miles farther along every second. But we don't feel any of these motions. Stuck here on the surface of the earth, we don't perceive them at all. The earth doesn't even look round. We feel like stationary observers on a flat earth. So how did our current understanding of the solar system come about? Early geocentric models, those devised in the time of the ancient Greeks and earlier, were based largely on symmetry and aesthetics, and not much on observation. In the ancient Greek view of the cosmos as conceived by great thinkers such as Aristotle, the universe was a geometrically perfect set of concentric crystalline spheres, with the Earth fixed at the center. In Aristotle's model, the sphere closest to the Earth held the moon, the next Mercury, then Venus, then the Sun, then Jupiter, then Saturn, then a sphere holding all of the fixed stars, and finally the so-called sphere of the prime mover, where the mysterious prime mover imparted a spinning motion on the outermost sphere that carried over to all of the others and caused things to orbit. As a brief aside, you might have noticed that there are planets that we know of today, namely Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, that are not mentioned in this model. In fact, none of the ancient cosmologies deal with Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto, because none of these are naked-eye planets. They're very com faint compared to most of the stars that you see in the night sky, and were not discovered until after the invention of the telescope, well after. The ancients didn't know about them, so we'll put them aside for now and talk only about the five naked eye planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, as well as the Sun, Moon, and most importantly, the Earth. If you were to watch the motion of the naked eye planets across the sky over the course of a year or two, several problems with this Aristotelian model would become apparent as they did to the ancient Greeks and Romans. Let's start with the simplest of these observations, one that you yourself may have made at some point. Venus is the brightest object in the night sky after the sun and the moon, and for that reason its motion has been studied since man first looked at the sky. No matter how long you watch the sky, though, you'll never see the planet Venus at midnight. In fact, Venus is never observed to be farther than 47 degrees away from the sun in the sky. The entire sky rotates 360 degrees every 24 hours from our perspective, which means that objects move 360 over 24, or 15 degrees per hour across the sky. If Venus can't be farther than 47 degrees from the sun, then it will never set later than 47 degrees divided by 15 degrees per hour, or about three hours after the sun sets. 
You'll often see Venus low in the west in the early evening sky just after sunset. In this context, it's known as the evening star. When it's on the other side of the sun, you may see it rise in the eastern sky a few hours, but never more than three, before the sun rises. In this context, it's known as the morning star. Mercury is similar, but fainter and also more tightly constrained. It never gets farther than 28 degrees from the sun, which means that you can only see it within about two hours of sunset or sunrise, unless you look for it in the daytime, which I don't recommend. This planet was named after the Roman god Mercury, Hermes to the Greeks, whose winged shoes allowed him to travel quickly and made him the messenger of the gods. It was given this name because it moves very rapidly through the sky, appearing in the evening sky one month and on the other side of the sun in the morning sky the next. A good cosmology needs to explain these two observations. Aristotle must have been aware of the fact that something was different about the orbits of Venus and Mercury relative to the other planets, as he put their crystalline spheres in between those of the moon and the sun. But his model is difficult to reconcile with the observable reality that neither planet can be seen at midnight. Recall that objects that are visible at midnight are on the opposite side of the Earth relative to the Sun. So if these planets are never seen at midnight, that makes this portion of their orbit in this model, when they're on the opposite side of the Earth from the Sun, against observations. In reality, they must not pass around the backside of the Earth relative to the Sun, otherwise we should be able to see them at midnight. An ancient Roman astronomer named Ptolemy created the most famous geocentric model that fixes this problem. He left the sun, moon, and all the other planets on circular orbits around the Earth, but he eliminated the circular orbits of Mercury and Venus around the Earth. Instead, he imagined a line connecting the Earth and the sun, and he hinged the orbits of Venus and Mercury to this line. This fixes the problem of Venus and Mercury always appearing near the Sun. Mercury is on a smaller orbit than Venus, keeping it closer to the Sun from the perspective of Earth, and neither planet can pass around the backside of Earth. They both stay close to the Sun in the sky. But this wasn't the only thing that Ptolemy needed to fix. The outer planets, those beyond the Sun in this model, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, also have peculiar orbits when watched carefully on yearly timescales. This brings us to another problem in Aristotelian cosmology, that of retrograde motion. The planets beyond the Sun in geocentric models, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, rise in the east and set in the west just like everything else in the sky. But they also generally move a bit farther east relative to the background constellations each day so that if you were to watch their motion over the course of weeks and months, they would generally move eastward through the zodiacal constellations. This is why planets don't appear on star maps or planispheres. They're not fixed in their locations like the stars are. In fact, the word planet is derived from the ancient Greek word meaning wandering star. Given this, you might expect that Mars will move along the ecliptic just like the Sun does straight from Leo to Virgo and beyond in this video. However, this is not the case. As you can see when I play the video, Mars will move towards Virgo, but then it will turn around and move back towards Leo again for a while, before continuing on into Virgo and beyond. These loops of backward western motion are called retrograde loops, because the planet is moving in the opposite direction relative to background constellations than it usually does. Retrograde motion is therefore the apparent backward motion of a planet relative to the constellations. In a pure Aristotelian cosmology, it's impossible to explain these retrograde loops. If the planets are all orbiting a stationary Earth, 
They'll always move in the same direction in the sky from our perspective. So here again, Ptolemy needed a modification to fix the Aristotelian cosmos and make them consistent with observation. To do this, he placed an orbit on top of an orbit for all of the outer planets in order to force them to occasionally move retrograde. These mini orbits were called epicycles. If you imagine a planet orbiting on this epicycle loop, while well, the entire epicycle moves along the larger planetary orbit, you can see how this reproduces occasional backward motion. If you ever played with the children's toy called a spirograph, which uses the same general concept of a wheel inside a wheel, you might be familiar with this pattern. If you imagine that you're an observer on Earth looking out at this planet, you would see it appear to move forward, then briefly backward, then forward again. So here is a more global view of the complete Ptolemaic model of the solar system. The Earth is still at the center. The planets Venus and Mercury orbit on orbits that lie on top of a line connecting the Earth and the Sun. And the outer planets orbit on epicycles that are centered on a larger orbit around the Earth. You can see right away here that this model is getting complicated. So this brings me to an important scientific principle called Occam's razor, which states that the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. Here's a top-down view of the solar system as we know it to be today, with the sun at the center and all the planets, including Earth, orbiting it, side by side with a Ptolemaic Earth-centered model. The left-hand model, the Ptolemaic one, is complex and asymmetric. In the right-hand diagram, all of the planets orbit the sun in the same way, albeit at different speeds and on different sized orbits. There's a lovely symmetry, consistency, and simplicity. This sun-centered model was most famously advocated for by Nicholas Copernicus, a Polish astronomer who proposed it in the early 1500s. So we'll call this sun-centered model the Copernican solar system in some cases. So how does this sun-centered model reproduce the two phenomena that I just described? namely the fact that Mercury and Venus never get very far away from the Sun in the sky, and the fact that Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn exhibit retrograde motion. Let's take them one at a time. In the heliocentric model, Mercury and Venus are never far away from the Sun simply because we on Earth are orbiting outside of them and are always looking inward toward the inner solar system and therefore toward the Sun in order to see them. Venus can get a little farther away from the Sun than Mercury because it's on a larger orbit around the Sun. Neither one can be seen at midnight because their orbits don't take them on the other side of Earth relative to the Sun. So what about retrograde motion? To visualize how it works in a heliocentric solar system, picture the Earth at five different points in time along its orbit. Here's Mars at the same times. Notice that it moved less along its orbit than Earth has in the same amount of time. This is a consequence of the fact that the closer a planet is to the Sun, the faster it orbits, which we'll explain in more detail in the next lecture, and we'll just take for granted for now. So if we imagine where an observer on Earth will see Mars in the sky relative to a fixed set of background stars, when Earth and Mars are both at the first location in their orbits, Mars will appear here relative to these background stars. At the next step, it'll appear here, a little farther east than before, as expected. But as Earth pulls up alongside Mars in its orbit, this will change. At the next step, it'll be here, a little farther west than it was before. Then again, farther west, before curving around to the east again. It's a bit like passing a slower car on the freeway. As you approach them, they still appear to be moving forward, albeit slower and slower as you approach. As you pull next to and then past them, they seem to move backward from your perspective, 
although in reality you're still both moving forward. In this way, a heliocentric cosmology can explain retrograde motion simply as an effect of the relative motion of a slower moving outer planet as the Earth passes by. No crazy epicycles, no spiraling motions needed. Despite the elegant simplicity of heliocentric models, Ptolemy's convoluted Earth-centered model of the solar system prevailed for more than 1,000 years, including more than 100 years after the death of Copernicus. In fact, the Copernican model was considered heresy, and an early proponent named Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake by the Roman Inquisition for his beliefs. Hearing that, two questions come immediately to mind, at least for me. The first is, were ancient people aware of this simple, elegant, heliocentric model? And if so, why did they prefer the convoluted geocentric model? The answer to the first question is a resounding yes. As you'll recall from earlier in this lecture, there was even an ancient Greek astronomer, Aristarchus of Samos, who advocated for a heliocentric cosmology. Aristotle himself must have been aware that there were, was an alternate explanation because he came up with the following three questions meant to refute sun-centered cosmologies. One, if the Earth really spins on its axis, why don't objects fly off? Two, if the Earth revolves around the sun, why aren't birds flying in the air left behind by the Earth's motion? And lastly, if the Earth is in orbit around the Sun, then why don't we see nearby stars change their orientations relative to background stars over the course of the year? The first two of Aristotle's questions can be answered with one word, gravity. We'll talk in much more detail about it in the next lecture, so I'd like to focus instead on this third point. Notice that in phrasing it here, I've used the word parallax. So what is that? In describing the Aristotelian cosmos, I made one notable oversimplification. I said that all of the stars were on a fixed sphere outside of the orbits of the planets. In truth, there were some 55 spheres in Aristotle's cosmology, including several layers of stars in the outer regions, perhaps to help explain why the stars we see in the sky are all different brightnesses. Closer stars would be brighter and distant ones fainter. The Greeks hypothesized, correctly in this case, that some of the stars in the sky were closer to the Earth than others. Let's take an imaginary nearby star, shown in red here, and project its location relative to more distant background stars, which is what the diagram on top shows. When Earth is nearest the star, it'll appear at the location uh, shown in red in the top map relative to the more distant stars. But as Earth moves in its orbit around the Sun, the star will move first to one side, then the other, relative to the more distant background stars. So let's watch it here. And again. This effect, called parallax, is essentially the side-to-side -side motion of a nearby object relative to more distant ones as your point of view changes. Here's another way to think of it. Hold your thumb out in front of your face and wink first your right eye, then your left. As you wink right, left, right, left, you should see the location of your thumb move left and right relative to the background of the room. Try moving your thumb closer to your face and do the same thing. The closer it is to your face, the more it will move relative to the background as you wink left and right. The farther away it is from your face, the less it will move. It's the same with parallax. The closer a star is to the Earth, the more it'll move back and forth relative to background stars as the Earth orbits the Sun. The farther away it is, the less it will move. Ancient observers expected the stars to be relatively close to the Earth, just outside of the orbits of the planets in our solar system. They expected that if the Earth truly revolved around the Sun, 
we'd see some nearby stars move back and forth relative to more distant stars as the Earth was on one side of its orbit around the sun than the other. Kind of like winking your left eye than your right. Observers looked and looked for this effect and never saw any stars move relative to others on yearly timescales. We know today that the stars are much farther away than the ancient Greeks believed. With modern technology, we can actually observe parallax in nearby stars, but it's a very, very small effect. Even for the very nearest stars, it's still just a fraction of a degree. Much too small for the Greeks to measure with their naked eye. The lack of observed parallaxes of stars was one of the most convincing arguments against heliocentric cosmologies, but there was also an element of human conceit. As humans, we want to believe that we're special. We want the Earth to be the center of the cosmos, and ancient astronomers were willing to swallow a little complexity in their models of the solar system as long as they could keep the Earth at the center. The story of the downfall of Earth-centered models is principally one of three men. Tycho Brahe, Galileo Galilei, and Johannes Kepler. Tycho Brahe, the first of these men, was, ironically enough, a staunch supporter of the geocentric universe. Brahe was born in 1546, just three years after the death of Nicholas Copernicus. As the Copernican solar system was still not widely accepted, Tycho Brahe came of age when the Ptolemaic model of the solar system was well over a thousand years old. It was a bit musty, too. Over the course of a millennium of use, astronomers had often had to tweak the Ptolemaic model to make its predictions of the positions of the planets match reality. The mathematics of the Ptolemaic model could not be extrapolated indefinitely to predict the location of the planets at any given time in the future. Tycho Brahe set out to correct this problem, to fix the mathematics of the Ptolemaic model to make it better match observations and improve its ability to make predictions. As fuel for these recalculations, he made many, many years of meticulous observations of the positions of objects in the night sky and recorded them. In the post-Copernican era in which Brahe lived, there was mounting doubt as to the validity of Earth-centered cosmologies. Brahe proposed an alternative, a so-called geo-heliocentric solar system, in which the moon and sun orbited the Earth, but all of the other planets orbited the sun, such as in the model depicted here. If you could take a top-down view of the motions in this solar system, it would look like this. This is still pretty convoluted relative to this model, which is the behavior of the Copernican solar system. Around the same time that Tycho Brahe was meticulously cataloging the location of stars and planets in Denmark, the Italian Galileo Galilei was making his own revolutionary observations from Florence. Galileo was often called the father of modern science, and he made many important discoveries about the nature of both heaven and earth. He's responsible for articulating the laws of motion that first got Isaac Newton thinking about gravity, for quantifying the behavior of the pendulum, and for inventing a number of scientific instruments. According to his own account in the book The Starry Messenger, in 1609, Galileo heard rumors of a Dutch invention that would magnify distant objects, making them appear much closer. Although he attempted to obtain one of these Dutch perspective glasses, he was unable to do so, and instead worked out the principles himself and constructed his own, without ever having seen one. He brought an early version that magnified objects by a factor of eight, already nearly three times the magnification of other telescopes of the time, to the local government in Venice. 
the government officials, recognizing the importance of this device, promptly doubled his salary and made his professorship at the University of Padua a lifetime appointment. Galileo was a great believer in what we would call today popular science. He published his books in Italian rather than in Latin in order to allow them to be read more widely. He quickly communicated the principles of the telescope not just to the Venetian government, but to the population at large. This, combined with his improvements to the optical design of the telescope, which eventually resulted in models with as many as 30 times the magnification of the human eye, made him the father of the modern telescope, although he was not technically its inventor. Galileo was also the first person on record to point these devices skyward. In 1610, just a year after making his first telescope, Galileo made observations of Jupiter that you see recorded here. It's hard to imagine now when this is the picture that most people have of Jupiter in their minds, an image taken by a satellite physically in orbit around the planet, something that wasn't even conceivable in Galileo's time. How surprising these observations must have been to Galileo. People had known since ancient times that there was something different about the planets since they moved relative to the fixed background stars. But to the naked eye, planets like Jupiter don't look any different than an ordinary bright star. When Galileo looked through his telescope at Jupiter, he saw not only that Jupiter was a disk, an extended object and not just a point of light, but that there were three little stars not visible to the naked eye nearby, all lying in the same plane. This must have seemed at first like a mere coincidence, a chance alignment. But when Galileo returned to Jupiter the following night, he found that these objects had moved, which is why you see, it, see them drawn in many different positions here. As he came back to Jupiter night after night, it eventually became clear to him that there were four of these little stars, not three, and that they moved from night to night, each by different amounts. Eventually he realized that these must not be stars at all, but moons much like the Earth's moon that orbited Jupiter, each with a different period. Today these moons, whose names are Io, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede, are collectively called the Galilean moons of Jupiter, in honor of their discoverer. Again here, it's difficult to imagine how revolutionary, even heretical, this observation was. Galileo had just shown, rather unequivocally, that an Aristotelian cosmology was impossible. To see moons orbiting another heavenly body was proof that not everything in the heavens orbits the Earth. Once Galileo started pointing his telescope at other objects in the solar system, blows to Aristotelian cosmology kept coming. Although you should certainly not do this at home, as it's probably what caused Galileo to go blind later in life, he pointed his telescope at the sun and found that it was spotted. Furthermore, these spots moved across the surface of the sun from day to day. In Aristotelian cosmology, all heavenly objects were perfect, uniform spheres. So this was also a surprise. In pointing his telescope at the moon, still one of the most striking observations that you can make with a small telescope, he saw that it was covered in mountains and valleys, deep craters and uneven surfaces, also far from perfect. When he pointed his telescope at Venus, he made perhaps the most surprising discovery of all. He found that Venus, like the moon, went through phases and was not always wholly illuminated. The phases he saw were not consistent with the Ptolemaic model of the solar system. To understand how they're contrary to geocentric doctrine, we'll need a diagram. Recall that in the Ptolemaic model, Venus orbits on an epicycle, that's locked to the line connecting the Earth and the Sun. So its orbit looks like this from the Earth's perspective. You can see here that if we consider the portion of Venus that's facing the Sun at each point along its orbit and how much of it is visible from Earth, it'll always appear to be either in a crescent or a new phase from our perspective. In a heliocentric solar system, on the other hand, Venus is allowed to pass behind the sun from our perspective here on Earth, 
and all phases from new to full are possible. Galileo observed Venus to pass through all of these phases, and also observed a change in its relative size consistent with Venus being closest to Earth in the crescent phase and most distant in the full phase. So let's put these observations together. The observed motions of the moons of Jupiter told Galileo that all heavenly bodies did not orbit the Earth. His observations of the sun and moon revealed that heavenly bodies were not perfect, uniform spheres. The phases of Venus told him that the planet must pass behind the sun from the perspective of the Earth in order to appear full. Each observation alone should have called geocentric models into question. Taken together, they're quite damning. However, the climate in Italy at the time, and in particular in the Catholic Church, was strictly anti-Copernican. In 1616, Galileo was warned against advocating for heliocentrism by a friend who was also a cardinal in the church. Galileo was told to treat the heliocentric explanation for these phenomena as purely a mathematical construct, useful in interpreting his observations, but not a reflection of reality. For a time, Galileo obeyed, and put off bringing all of these pieces together into a defense of the Copernican cosmology. However, in 1632, he received papal permission to publish the book Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, where the two systems that he pitted against one another were Copernican, heliocentric, and Ptolemaic, geocentric cosmologies. The book is framed as a dialogue between two philosophers, each supporting a different system. However, Simplicio, the character defending the Ptolemaic Earth-centered system, is clearly the loser of the debate, often getting caught in contradictions. Unfortunately for Galileo, the Pope did not perceive the book as the balanced portrayal he'd requested, and in fact the character Simplicio parrot some of the views held by the Pope himself, making him look foolish. The Church banned the book, a ban that was not lifted until 200 years later in 1835. Galileo was called to trial on suspicion of heresy and sentenced to house arrest where he remained for the rest of his life. In light of Galileo's widely publicized observations of the phases of Venus and the influence of the Church, most scholars post-Galileo chose to adopt the geo-heliocentric model of Tycho Brahe, which allowed for the observed phases of Venus without requiring that the Sun be the center of the solar system. They were not forced to adopt Galileo's Copernican model because, despite its simplicity, it was not any better at predicting the location of the planets in the sky than any other model. It turned out that Galileo and Copernicus before him were making a key incorrect assumption about the motions of the planets around the sun. Ironically enough, it was Tycho Brahe's apprentice, Johannes Kepler, who eventually disproved Brahe's model and dealt the final death blow to geocentric cosmologies. Kepler was able to correct all of the problems with Copernican models by describing three simple characteristics about the orbit of planets around the sun. We'll talk about these in detail in the next lecture. In closing, I want to leave you again with this pale blue dot picture, which I think puts all of this into perspective a bit. Debates as to the nature of the universe have been around as long as man has, and will probably continue well into the future. Our current perspective on the universe has been hard won. It has taken centuries of observation to understand the nature of our own solar system and to be able to reliably predict the motion of celestial bodies. It's not difficult to understand why we have always wanted to believe that we're the center of the universe, but it's important to know that we're not. We should be humbled by this view of Earth as just another planet among many, orbiting in the same way as all the others, and maybe it can give us some much-needed perspective on the importance of human affairs. The reason that this image of the pale blue dot of Earth is so profound can't be explained any better than by the man who advocated for it in the first place, the late great astronomer Carl Sagan. So I'll leave you with a clip of him talking about it.
The spacecraft was a long way from home. I thought it might be a good idea, just after Saturn, to have them take one last glance homeward. From Saturn, the Earth would appear too small for Voyager to make out any detail. Our planet would be just a point of light, a lonely pixel. Hardly distinguishable from the many other points of light Voyager would see, nearby planets, far-off suns. But precisely because of the obscurity of our world thus revealed, such a picture might be worth having. It had been well understood by the scientists and philosophers of classical antiquity that the Earth was a mere point in a vast, encompassing cosmos. But no one had ever seen it as such. Here was our first chance, and perhaps also our last, for decades to come. So, here they are. A mosaic of squares laid down on top of the planets, and a background smattering of more distant stars. Because of the reflection of sunlight off the spacecraft, the Earth seems to be sitting in a beam of light, as if there were some special significance to this small world. But it's just an accident of geometry and optics. There is no sign of humans in this picture. Not our reworking of the Earth's surface, not our machines, not ourselves. From this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known.